Attackers are only getting more proficient, so how can you proactively adapt your cybersecurity strategy? Core Security by Fortra helps you uncover and prioritize the risks that pose the biggest threat to your organization. Core Impact is a penetration testing tool that safely finds and exploits vulnerabilities using the same techniques as attackers. You can conduct advanced pen tests with ease using certified exploits and automations. Take your engagements even further by pairing with our additional red teaming tools from Cobalt Strike and Outflank. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra Core Security. The Security Weekly News is live on Tuesdays and Fridays at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, most every week. I try to scan and produce a quick look at some major stories to help you keep up with what's going on in and around the industry in a short format. Myself, Jason Wood, and other guest commentators provide greater insight every week. I'm Doug White, and I hope that you will look for the Security Weekly News in all of your favorite podcast catchers and subscribe for the latest content. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We're recording live from Broadcast Alley here in Moscone West. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Check, the Executive Director of Cyber Protection Solutions at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. Hello, John. Hey, Welcome. Mike. How are you today? I'm doing very well. We're, it's, it's the last day of the conference. We're kicking things off. So well, appreciate you taking the time. I see we've fully transitioned to only sneakers at this point. I, absolutely. Stay comfortable <laughs> and relax. <laughs> we got to survive. That's right. <laughs> the other thing that, so companies also need to survive because uh, CISOs don't enjoy writing those those breach disclosures that start, we take your security seriously. Right. So that, that's a little bit of a reactive response. Incidents, you know, I'm not being pessimistic, I think, when we say that organizations are probably going to be breached in one way or another. They should be prepared, but it's a lot better to be prepared. So what what are some ways that we can start thinking of incident response before the incident happens? Well, I think the number one thing is across all of your business, no matter what the job role is, whether it's security, supply chain, legal, talent acquisition, everybody has to have some level of baseline and be a stakeholder in what your response is going to be. Communications. Because everybody, it takes everybody, once something happens, <clears throat> to recover. And without them being aware, the first time they really hear about it or understand what a certain type of attack might be, I mean, certain things have made it out into the public domain enough, like ransomware, where people at least have some level of understanding. But they might right. not understand all the other aspects of what different type of attacks might look like. Yeah, and you rattled off a great list there, and it was went well beyond just like, oh, the developer who sees this is the, the RCE, or this is the CVE number that they hit, and right. how do we respond to this? There's comms in there, there's legal, there's privacy. So, but they're not dealing with code, I don't think, all the, day, all the time. So how do, you, how do you bring them in? How do you, do you say, we're going to have a breach, or rather than say, you know, without scaring them, with getting them prepared for what something looks well, like. Well, critical part of is also, so what is the role of everyone when something does happen? So the way you bring them in is, if there are, um, you have a, you have cybersecurity insurance, you have ins breach insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does that mean? What happens, how do you in engage with your insurer? What is their role and responsibility? Are they going to show up with their own response teams and say, whatever teams you have, stand those down, because we'll take it from here to figure out what happened. Or you can really understand how that process works, so, People know where to engage and how to engage, and what their roles are. There may be certain emergency procurements you need to do, or certain legal uh, actions that need to be taken related to a breach, whether it's informing your stakeholders or uh, other things that may require you to ensure that you're responding properly. So these are lots of, it sounds like lots of documentation processes, run books. I'm a I'm a D and D player. I like my th that type of tabletop gaming. I'm sure there's got to be an aspect of tabletop exercises here too. Oh, run something through. A hundred percent. And that's one of the, the critical aspects is it's hard to get people's attention to do a tabletop exercise. Oh yeah. So one of the things we really try to do when we're uh, hosting those for partner companies that we mm -hmm. work with is getting them out of their day to day job for a day and really pulling them out to like almost an off site type event where they can be focused, and you can try to get them into the mindset of a breach has happened, versus, okay, two hours, I mean, I spent all morning you know, doing my day job, whatever that might be, I go into a room for two hours, do a tabletop exercise, check in my phone, email, smart devices the whole time, and then leave two hours later, and did you really participate? Do you really understand? Are right. you really what in you the moment? Yeah. That's one of the critical things, is really you gotta be in the moment to really fully engage 
and not be distracted by all the things that are out there that like to distract <laughs> us. So w what are some fun ways to set up scenarios for organizations? Because I, I mean, I'm going to imagine not ev everybody's heard of Log4j, SolarWinds, you know, these big things, but not everybody's going to be attacked like SolarWinds. It might be ransomware or something like that. Well, how, what do you set up to get those people engaged so they're not checking their phones? Well, we try to find something topical to the industry they're in, okay. and what, what are, where their focus is. Because there's, like, like you mentioned earlier, there's, there's probably an example of your industry where somebody's been breached. Very likely. <laughs> and that really gives them the good idea. So if you're, if you're a retailer, okay, mm -hmm. what does that supply chain look like now that your, your, your e-commerce site is down and you're losing a million dollars an hour because no one can buy your products from your, your, your presence? So that's really got to think through, what does that look like? How do you have a, what, what level of resiliency could you build in? Mm -hmm. How would you get some level of that customer, you know, externally facing site back up to where you can do what your business is there to do, which is provide that product to your customers. And what's interesting so far is that we've talked about, you, you rattled off a list of people, important positions, what their roles are, responsibilities. We talk about tabletops and processes. We haven't touched on tools. And it's interesting, I think, that we, you know, we're coming to that last. Is that, are they less important? Where, what's their role in, like, can't the tools just protect us all from getting breached? I, you know, just install this and it works, you know, you don't worry about anything else. It'd be so much easier. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I hear sometimes. Uh, well, it's really the most critical thing in any tooling is really, are you taking the time to truly integrate whatever you have purchased and part of your framework of what is the, what is the, the key things you want to defend and how are you taking advantage of it? Buying a tool for the sake of a tool because it will just do something makes no difference. I really, yeah. like I mentioned, uh, like to take the KonMari approach. Get rid of the clutter. You don't need to have 50 tools that have overlap and you've got one because it does 5% of something. Is that really totally necessary? You're not going to utilize it. Or also if you're putting yourself at risk where you've got a single smart subject matter expert that's responsible mm -hmm. for a tool. When that person leaves, yeah. that causes real problems. And we see that with our, our partner companies a lot of times that we work with. They have that key person leave and all of a sudden they're calling us to say, hey, can you take this, pick this we up for us? Because we can't fill yeah. this role again. This person's gone. So it's really the, the tooling is absolutely critical, but it all comes down, I mean, I'm in the people business. It's 100% about the people. And if the people don't, aren't a part of how you establish the tool chain, what's it supposed to do, mm -hmm. what are the outcomes you're desiring, and they're not given the proper training and downtime to really appreciate and think about things. Good it can't point. just be a continuous grind where they're on the job and it's the next thing coming at them. Burnout so easy to it's, hit. It's yeah. terrible. And so that's one of the things we really try to focus on is giving people the time to, you know, rest, refit and retool. Not, nothing new. That's a great approach. <laughs> and that's treating, that's treating people well so they'd be also sharp. And that's why you also practice, but Absolutely. they're also not burned out. They're not just overly cynical about why are we doing this today? I'll just hit this button. Absolutely. I mean, I can tell from my personal experience, I used to not, uh, I used to stay up a lot, right? Didn't sleep very much. One day about 10 a.m. after working here in San Francisco, I walked to work at 6 a.m. 10 a.m. I looked down, I had two different colored shoes on. <laughs> one had a heel about like this, one had a heel like this. I was like, hmm, sleep deprivation is a real thing. It might have had a little <laughs> bit of an impact. So that's a great counter example of probably something not to do. Um, you know, we talked about you know, communication, tabletop exercises. Do you have some other counter examples of some, some ways perhaps not to prepare and not to respond that we could learn from? Well, the, so like anything, when you, have an, uh, when you have an emergency situation, everybody reacts differently. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big challenges is the understanding who on the team might have a the sky is falling reaction and start going to panic mode. Because one of the worst things you can do when a breach or an incident happens is start taking action immediately without knowing or is that the action I should be taking at this time? If I do that, if I go run and turn off all the servers, is that the, really the thing I should have done? Oh, right? Yep, you got to really, have a plan. but people panic and they're going to do something to action because their phone's blowing up, the president of the company's saying, what are you doing? Right? So they're going to take an action without understanding, okay, what's the sequence of actions we're going to take? Do I need to pause for a minute, make sure we, we work through this if you don't have a solid plan? But for me, one of the things that I see that's the worst thing somebody do mm -hmm. is, Take action immediately without understanding, should I be taking that action? It creates way more problems in the long run, every time. <laughs> every time. Totally believe it. And goes back to the idea, just be prepared, right? There's also an aspect, I you know, was joking because I, I love to make fun of the, the, the phrase, we, we take your security seriously. It's, it becomes a bit of a platitude and a bit empty if it's not followed up by anything of, of substance. Mm -hmm. There's, but you, you know, companies perhaps do need to prepare a breach disclosure of some kind. 
What do you look for? What do you recommend in the sense of transparency, sharing for their customers, sharing so, you know you've been impacted? How do you how do you have that conversation in, in a positive way? Well, we try so we we provide them with the information they need, mm -hmm. right? That's up to them and their stakeholders, their board of directors, and the disclosures based on whatever regulations that industry needs to follow for how they're going to disclose. We certainly want to give them all the information they, they need, mm -hmm. and we can give them examples of here's how it was done by companies in the past, and it was perceived like it went very well, and here's examples where people maybe held on to information way too long, and it was not the outcome. But that's really, again, that's that businesses based on you know, where, where they want to uh, be perceived by the public and where they're going to position themselves post-breach. And that's, that's, that's at a board level discussion, right? Mm -hmm. We're really there to help guide and provide information that allows them to report. But in the end, they have to make that call and like I, you know, go back towards the, when there's an emergency and you're not prepared, you might not make the call you need to in the moment. Absolutely. <laughs> then when you see that, um, how do you often see who makes that call or do they also, like even in the tabletop exercises or the, the processes in the planning, are there often parts of the organization that get forgotten or they get left out and everybody's like, oh, we actually should have spoken to Alice, Bob, this, you know, in, in this particular department? It's really, a lot of times it comes down to uh, comms, communications, okay. making sure that they're involved and really somebody that is a communications person understands how to communicate to your stakeholders, whether they're customers, yeah. employees, board of directors, whatever the case might be. So that's a critical aspect of how do you how do you frame a conversation? How do you make sure people really understand what's happened? Mm -hmm. what, what's their role in whatever's happened? What do they need to watch out for? So I say communications is one of the key groups that's not forgotten, but a lot of times the pe per person in charge, whoever that might be, decides I'm going to be the communications person. I'm going to write up this email with whatever notice and send it out to people. It might not be the best approach. Um, if you have that role, then it's really difficult because you know, depending on the company size, they don't have that diversification. Maybe the person that's true. That's the president is the comms person, is the TA person. You never know what that, that person's other roles, other duties as assigned <laughs> might be. Suddenly they're wearing lots of hats, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Now, I also talked about, you know, I threw out SolarWinds, Log4j, ransomware. Are there certain types of attacks that you're seeing perhaps more prevalent now? I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to go, you know, pull out the crystal ball, predict what the attacks are going to be, but are there certain patterns that, uh, of the type of threat actors that these are techniques they're using that people can prepare for, perhaps more so on the technology side too? Well, it's definitely escalating, right? Mm -hmm. Continue that gone are the days when somebody sends you a poorly worded email. Now it's specifically targeted from your bank with your name, and maybe somebody, one of your relatives, it looks like it's coming from your relative. Okay. The, the amount of data that is out there now with, with the AI and those types of tools coalescing those things based on, hey, I know who John Check is. I'm going to go search everything I know about him and do a very targeted campaign at him based on not just him, but, okay, who's he related to? What are the environmentals he's in? Where does that person go every day? What do they experience? It's, that's the, the biggest challenge is that I see is it's, it's really escalated the targeting part of this. And that's super, super uh, worrisome to me because that sophistication is way beyond what people have seen in a classic phishing email. It just manifests itself in a, maybe a phishing email and a text within the same, you know, within five oh, minutes yeah. that says, looks like it's the same information, right? Your bank is saying something. Well, I just got an email and I got a text. It, may, it must be my bank. It must be, yes. And, and hopefully we, you know, part of that too, maybe a little bit, we've been talking about preparing for the proactive aspects of responding to incidents. There's a little bit of the postmortems too. Hopefully we have moved beyond just blaming the user because it is, these, this type of sophistication can fool anyone, especially if they're right. under pressure. And if we don't have multi-factor authentication, we don't have other tools, I think those are more of the failures that, that, that um, failed the people rather than the people well, themselves be blamed. Well, I'm, I'm a pre-mortem guy. I want to take it. Take the. Love I want to work. Yep. Figure out before the patients died, right? <laughs> post mortem, it's too late. Something bad's happened. Let's do pre mortem. So let's make sure that we're using multi factor authentication. Yes. Let's make sure that people have a foundational level of awareness and understanding. That's that's where I am firmly. 
Pre-mortem. Yes. yes. No more post-mortem. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> much, I love a zombie movie myself, but I agree with you. Let's do the pre-mortems. <laughs> Just prevent as much as we can with those <laughs> breaches. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> well, John, this is a wonderful conversation. You clearly came with a plan and well-prepared to talk about incident response. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate your time. <laughs> appreciate it again, John. If you want to learn more about Raytheon, visit securityweekly.com slash Raytheon RSAC. And stick around. We've got a lot more coming up on the live stream today. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We're recording live from Broadcast Alley here in Moscone West. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with Amitai Ratzon, CEO of Pantera. Welcome, Amitai. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to have you here because we want to talk about automation. This is, I, I love automation in many ways, and this is about automating security or, or validating security. That's kind of a, a, a unique angle, I think. Tell, me, tell us a little bit, what, what, what are we validating? Why do we need this? Thank you, and great question. So, in fact, automated security validation is a new concept that was kind of really invented by Pentera uh, two years ago, uh, kind of taking us kind of a few kind of um, steps away uh, in a good way from good old pen testing and vulnerability management. And if you try to think what is it we're trying to achieve, uh, look at the typical, typical enterprise, mid-market, large enterprise out there, a retailer, a manufacturing company, a finance company, these guys typically buy tons of stack. They buy tons of nuanced solutions mm -hmm. like AV and EDR and firewall and everything around cloud security and application security. So what, do they really, what does it really mean? They actually buy lots of point solutions, some of the mega solutions, and kind of to protect the castle. But most of these solutions are kind of preventative in nature and they're there silent till something happens. Mm -hmm. Now, when we, Pentero, when we go to them, we talk to CISOs and we ask them, so are you comfortable with everything you bought? I mean, do, do you know that now you're good? Is it working? Is it working? Yeah. So the answers we get is, you know, I mean, we're buying best of breed. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our research. We have great programs. We, hired, we try to hire the best people. Mm -hmm. We go to conferences. We try to stay informed. But do we know versus do we just assume we're good? I mean, we don't get good, good answers there. So Pentera is really here to uh, kind of keep the CISO and the team humble in the moment of truth. We kind of come in, it's an agentless kind of solution. Without deploying agents, it's mm -hmm. gone lots of noise and, lots, and like interfering with IT and with users' operations. We come in and we um, basically validate um, that everything you bought and built uh, would survive the moment of truth. And that is, uh, you know, using uh, emulated cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, Pentera is research driven. We're 250 people, and the, the platform and the features and modules are all you know, outputs of lots of research that was done over the years. So the platform already has lots of attack techniques and lots of very, uh, I would say, unique and special kind of EDR evasive techniques and others to really show the company that we're challenging how good they are, how good they're performing against the latest, latest attacks. Uh, and then we kind of, you know, uh, we, we see interesting kind of uh, situations because people that think that, they're, that they really suck, they're actually good. Mm -hmm. People that just don't know get their score and they say, oh my God, I'm C minus. How come? But Deloitte were here two weeks ago and they told me I'm A plus. So how did you get there exactly? And then we start the conversation. So, and it's the only platform that actually shows our customers how the attacker think. We actually, you know, they said that the attacker thinks in vectors while defender thinks in lists. Right, so we actually showed the vector that goes in the company, how one thing leads to the next. And it's the first time that customers, that are security practitioners, mm -hmm. see that in real time. Because before Pentera, um, that whole pen test magic was done by third parties. They didn't share the process of how they get to stuff, but rather the end report. Now we open people's eyes and they say, wow, now in real time, like a video game, we actually mm -hmm. see the attacker's path inside and wow, it's an eye-opening. It's, it's the first time we, we see that. It is, and you know, my background is many, many ages ago, I was doing pen testing, manual pen testing, but I, you know, I sort of got burnt out on that. It gets boring after a while. And I, I love how you said moment of truth, because this is what the attackers are doing. Tell us a bit more about 
what it means to like experience that moment of truth or be able to see what you know that, that explanation of that attack yeah yeah behavior. yeah great question so i think it all starts with pentera when you know our reps are trying to convince the skeptical prospect to give us a chance mm -hmm. because who wouldn't who wouldn't want that magic button that you click that then tells you how well you're doing against maze yeah, our happy evil. face or a sad face. exactly yeah. i mean who doesn't want that that, that button so we work very hard to convince our, our prospective customers to go into the POV room. And we've invented this excellent like six hour POV methodology. So we don't like, you know, we don't kill you when you prove the concept. <laughs> it, it doesn't take like three to six months. You don't need to compose a project team. Our engineers, they come in, come in at nine, they connect and by 2 p.m. they're out mm -hmm. and that's it. So that experience has to be you know, as provocative as possible in a good way so that people don't have more questions. And when you say what that moment of tr truth look like, um, that could be um, the moment when, you know, Pantera is able after two minutes of like, you know, uh, enumeration and dynamic exploitation to create a domain user in the network. And the customers say, but how did you do that? I mean, I had everything in place or someone that thought that they've scanned for all the log for shell and then oh, not only course. that we identify the log for shell, we also also exploit it and progress the attack thanks to that uh, identification exploitation. I mean, that overwhelms people because it's happening in their face, in front of them, in a very visual way, mm -hmm. as opposed to a pen testing act that happens in some, you know, some corridor in floor number 11 out of 25, and the results of which you see two weeks after. So it's very real, it's here and now, and we're showing you, hey, do you see that? This means that we just took over this and this and that, and people participate in that moment of truth, and they actually see what we do. They ask questions, we pause, we play, we make it very visual for them. And, and I like that because you're describing a, an actual, a long sequence. There's a lot of things that come here, and mm -hmm. it gets away from that myth of attackers just have to be right once. It's more of attackers have to have an exploit, but then they have to avoid this detection. They have to avoid this other detection. They have to avoid the, the they have to pivot, but avoid the logging that's going to identify that pivot. And it sounds like what you're showing is this is the sequence that shows actually this tool failed here, or this tool failed here. You weren't tuned in this manner, and this is the way we can identify real attackers more and more effectively. Absolutely, and I would say one more thing that people are quite surprised by. Um, the pen testing industry have gotten our, you know, uh, customers used to um, what a pen test you know output looks like and that is usually a the pen testing team team comes over they do what they do and then the report ends with i mean some major achievements it usually ends with you know we have domain admin and clear text password and game over now we go to the next project but hey hold on getting domain admin and clear text password is good but what can you do with that so exploiting print nightmare on some endpoint is interesting, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not that interesting if it doesn't lead to something which is, you know, putting our hands on some, you know, important data points or the Swift server or something. It could be that the vulnerability that we've exploited that was categorized by Tenable, Rapid7 and Qualys mm -hmm. as critical. After you exploit it, you say it's not really critical because it leads nowhere. Here's context. It, it leads yes. nowhere. So when we look at Pentera, one of the things we do uh, we, we kind of, you know, open our, the, the eyes of our customers that instead of them looking at 3,000 vulnerabilities that came from one of the typical VM players, and then those are categorized into critical, high, medium, low, um, the Pentera users, they actually see 11 or 13 vulnerabilities and network misconfigurations, not just CVs. And those usually represent the root causes for the tunnels that go yeah. below ground. Uh, and, and if you just close those root causes, then you don't have to attend to vulnerability number five, six, seven, eight, because number one, if it, that is, if LLMNR is disabled, then you can't sniff credentials over SMB. Right. So why attend to things that are happening as a result of two, three, five, six, if you just shut down the root cause? And it's such a better conversation to have with your developers, with your administrators to say, here, please take it, take care of these dozen issues rather than here's your list of 2,000, we're having SLA, we'll be back in a month to figure out how many you fixed. Absolutely, and even the biggest customers that we speak to, the biggest banks, the biggest you know, uh, uh, retailers and, and asset managers, they don't, don't have the capacity, they don't have the manpower to deal with two, 3,000 you know, vulnerabilities. Nobody and should. And you know what, no one should today. Absolutely. The world has changed. This is the era of you know, being more concise and it's the era of context. So uh, we're, I hope we're adding, you know, some of those layers. Well, now you mentioned like big banks, for example, but big banks, Google's, 
they have their internal pen test team, their internal red teams. And so do you see, what kind of prevalence do you see of organizations that have that internal work? Absolutely. So um, as you might imagine, a company like Pentera, you know, we, we got our unicorn status December 2021. Nice. We're 800 customers across 43 countries. We're big. We work with the biggest banks in the world, but also with 100 employee law firms. So we're, you know, we're applicable to these guys and these guys, right? But you're absolutely right that as you go up market, the, the, the biggest companies would usually have um, some form of a red team internally. And those guys actually, when they see Pantera, they don't know at the beginning, they're skeptical. They kind of say, oh my God, I mean, is this going to replace me? Are you sure that you know, you know everything? Because you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and you're just like technology, right? At the beginning, we get this skepticism, but with time, we become the red teamers' best friends because this saves tons of time from them. So yeah, they can focus on the exotic stuff. So yes. if you're a really good red teamer, trust me, and, and you've been this guy in the past, I don't need to teach you anything. You don't want to deal with like, you know, the exhaustive stuff or like NMAP scanning and like just mapping and like creating the vulnerability maps and categorizing. You just want to go and like apply your like intuition and your creativity to the lucrative like stuff. And Pantera could look after the 90% while those very expensive and talented red teamers could look at the 10% They're probably only humans could take care of. Yeah, and, and you hit it exactly right. On the, it's the creativity that is still important for, for the humans, mm -hmm. but it's that continuous, I, I imagine. It's the, just that always ongoing scanning that's going to be helpful, as well as a 100-person law firm probably isn't going to have a, you know, a fully staffed three- or five-person red team. Absolutely. So I think when we talk about continuation and continuous, we talk about, you know, when we look at big enterprises, you can imagine that if you're, let's say you're a very big bank, let's say you're uh, I don't, without names, like a huge bank out of the United States with daughter companies and subsidiaries in 30 countries. Even if you do have red teams and you do deploy pen testers to do whatever they need to do, um, there's a certain element of standardization that's missing. Because how do you compare apples to apples? Let's say that you're a US bank mm -hmm. that's out of Silicon Valley or out of New York City or Boston or Dallas, and you have you know, your French branch and your Portugal branch and your Brazil branch, how, and, and then those guys do their security validation using Pentest com local Pentest companies, and they all tell you, hey, I score A+. Plus. But the, the teachers that gave them the A+, plus are different teachers. So it's not apples to, so you don't know as corporate whether all of your you know, branches, daughter companies, when they say A+, plus, this is the A+, plus that you refer to. So Pentera helps there a lot. So imagine you're the global CISO, and Pantera runs simultaneously at 25 countries, and by 2 p.m., that CISO sees like the, like the, 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 the scorecard of yes, all the companies. Consistency of a baseline. Yeah, and Pantera couldn't care less whether you're, there is no politics here. We're not a, we're not a professional services company, mm -hmm. so we don't care to show one company that they're C minus and these guys are A plus. We just see what we see, uh, and we say what we see, and I think that global companies that really care about standardizing the, like the red teaming and and, and kind of enjoying from the continuous nature, but across the world, they really enjoy from what we do. No, that's amazing. I think, and you already described how relatively easy it is just to do that proof of concept on, on board it. As we, as we wrap up here, is there an, another way that you would just um, highlight or point to the, the, this new category that, that you're describing? Absolutely. So um, some people kind of try to understand whether when we say automated security validation, we really mean that it's different than just pen testing or it's just like a nice, nice awards to the same thing. So when you talk about uh, uh, automated security validation, there are some more components that we include. For example, um, Active Directory password assessments as a matter of like a weekly thing you do. Mm -hmm. That's not pen testing, but that is part of security validation hygiene that one needs to undertake. Um, ransomware emulation, so beyond providing the dynamic pen testing across the network, inside out, outside in, we also allow a company to launch ransomware attacks against themselves that actually carry the characteristics of the main ransomware variants, that being Maze, R Evil, Conti, Lockbit, including the encryption of files and pinging IOCs outside the network. That is not pen testing. 
that is another layer that people are obsessed with. People really want to get a report showing right. them how well I'm doing against our evil or maze as opposed to how well I'm doing against a generic black box attack. And the last component we've just added is credentials exposure. Okay. The industry got used to threat intel being served in a certain way that we are challenging. So if up until Pentera went out with this credentials exposure module, the way a company would have consumed threat intel data is by getting lots of lists of credentials that leaked, and now I need to do something about it. Pentera takes leaked credentials from the outside, and we actually automatically integrate the credential that leaked into the attack that we're propagating inside without getting instruction from anyone. So it's kind of a natural evolution of the attack. So Pentera talks with the outside world, darknet, right. deep web, and everything we know from the inside to propagate the attack and advance the attack. So that is automated security validation in the holistic sense of things. And, and it's amazing, it's, it's a great summary because it's showing this is behavior, how does an org respond to these attackers' behavior, not this particular CVE. That's a wonderful Absolutely. summary. Thank you, Amitai. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you for having me. If, and if everyone wants to find out more about Pantera, visit securityweekly.com slash Pantera RSAC. Thank you, and stay tuned for more coming up in our live stream. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We're recording live from, Mos uh, from well, it is Moscone West, but it's also Broadcast Alley. I am your host, Mike Shima, not stumbling over quite all my words, but I also have here Thomas Kinsella, who's the founder and chief customer officer at Tynes. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you for having me. So, uh, no code, this is our topic. Is it no code, all humans? We, I think we need to define some terms here first. Yeah, so like no, no code automation is a, a way for people, analysts, engineers to automate repetitive manual tasks, but it is humans doing the, uh, it is humans doing the automation. Uh, so it's the people that are familiar with the process that maybe don't know how to code, so maybe don't know how to write Python or maybe don't know how to, um, yeah, like run a PowerShell script or something like that, that we allow them to build processes really, really easily in a nice simple drag and drop builder, uh, nice canvas, but we also have the power of code as well. So we've got a lot of power user features that enable them to, I suppose, be a, as effective as like a senior engineer, but with just without having to, uh, without having to, I suppose, go through the worry of uh, of coding and writing mumbo jumbo. <laughs> mumbo jumbo is the, the technical term. That's I, correct. I, yes. Well, certain, <laughs> certainly in my uh, yeah my security career, a lot of the uh, a lot of the security engineers who like wrote code, they they were they were very good at what they did, but their code was not as uh, not as good quality as they thought thought it was. So. <laughs> That's always the unfortunate surprise. But I think to your point, there there's an appeal here, especially for SOC analysts, yep. to be able to rely. They don't have to become coders, so they don't have to now, on top of their grueling day-to-day -day work, burn themselves more by learning code. This is what you're trying to solve. Exactly. So yeah, the reason we start we started the company was because we were working in security operations mm -hmm. for a long time. And it was really hard. We just had like way too many alerts. It was hard to hire good staff. Uh, there was that sense of inevitability that some incident was going to happen, and we knew yeah. we, need, we knew we needed to move fast. Um, and like automation isn't a new thing in security. Automation has been talked about for a long time. But when we looked at a lot of automation platforms and we found what other people were doing, we yeah we just thought it wasn't working and it was way too hard. So we found that like the people that were were really good at like coding, they didn't want to be doing something like building an integration or writing some Python code to create, a, you know, create an issue in Jira right. or, you know, contact a user on Slack. That wasn't there. They wanted to be building a threat intel platform or, you know, reverse engineering some malware. However, the people that were feeling the pain, the SOC analysts, they wanted somebody to build an integration in, with Jira. They wanted somebody to, you know, upload a file to VirusTotal. And they wanted, you know, they wanted the power that those guys have, but they didn't want to rely on them. So when we looked at those like other platforms, we didn't like them and we said, hey, maybe there's a way to empower the people that are feeding the pain to automate that pain and, you know, you know make themselves a little bit more effective and make their companies, uh, yeah, a lot more, a lot, a lot safer through enabling them to focus on more impactful I, Indeed. And, you know, as you point out, just, you know, Jira, we need Jira tickets for tracking. Slack is just a great yeah. communication. But if you're taking away the drudgery of just having to repeat all of these, you know, little tedious manual steps every single time, that seems like such a nice change. Exactly, and like it's 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 funny where you know you'll notice our colors. We're we're trying to be a little bit more of a one security vendor and a friendly <laughs> security vendor because the people that use the product they genuinely love it. We've got the highest net promoter score for any vendor at RSA on G two because the people that are using the platform are so happy with it. 
um, because they're getting rid of their they're getting rid of their pain. But yeah, yeah, they're able to yeah they're able to like yeah you know not worry about having to create a ticket. And also like yeah they're you know they're enabling their other their colleagues. They're showing off for their colleagues. Like hey look check out this amazing thing that I've built. Uh, and yeah, it's really yeah it's really powerful. It's it's a it's a fun it's a fun process. So and, and what a great feedback too to be able to say like people are, are th that kind of score comes from you're actually delivering value. You're actually solving something I had rather than just no code, chat GPT, AI. Here's the buzzword that does something. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we've got like a lot of a lot of really happy customers from you know small startups all the way up to you know Fortune tens and some incredibly sophisticated uh, security companies and security teams. Um, but yeah, we like the feedback that we get and the, the people that are using it, they, they genuinely love it. It's really uh, it's a it's a privilege to be in the position where people actually yeah, people actually like using the like using your product and oh, just, indeed. Yeah, get a get a lot of value out of it. So. now I do want to come back to some more of the sock side. Yeah, yeah. But I come from kind of a, a more application or product security background and I hear no code and I start to get worried. Does this mean no SDLC, no security? You know, is my attack surface expanding because of this? Yeah, absolutely. And that's like that's I think that's definitely the perception of uh, of no code and kind of a little bit of the the hesitation that a lot of people have mm -hmm. towards it. They hear it, they're like, oh maybe that you know, maybe I, I can't do the do the things that I might want to do. Fortunately we like you have to be able to do all those things, right? You have to have an SCLC. You have to be able to, you know, to have smart error handling. You have to be able to have retries. But we just build that in a, a an intuitive way into the platform. So if you, you know, you're worried about getting rate limited on, you know, whatever virus total or something like that, you can just have an, ah. an easy retry. If you're worried that, you know, your like whatever tool is going to go down, like I'll just put in an email address or put in a webhook, and we'll send you an alert to to go somewhere else. And if you want to, and you should have like, you know, decent. Uh, Decent life cycle of uh, of this of developing these workflows. You can you know use a test version and a live version and push you know push your version from test to live. You can have an audit trail for all of these things. The whole thing is that you know you, in order to do that though you don't need to know about like Git. Now, we can integrate with Git obviously, mm -hmm. but you don't need to know about complex uh, yeah complex complex areas. You're just able to I suppose, abstract away those so that the person that wants to wants to have that power can use them, but anybody that doesn't need it, yeah, they can just build and they can, uh, yeah. But the more sophisticated customers, they will absolutely be using all of those features, and they should be, so. And they should be, and I mean, I'll admit up front that even doing simple tasks, I've messed up more than one Git branch just with uh, the yeah. wrong commit. Uh, you want yes. every, uh, every other developer <laughs> on the planet. So. Yeah, but, and I think too, it's not so much that we, we need the code, we need the Git experts. We just, more of, of these processes, an access log or an audit log, right? Access controls. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like, and again, we have that, that we have that functionality. So you have audit logs to see who did what, when, and you mm -hmm. can like roll back to a particular version. But you also have like the ability to, uh, you know, have, uh, yeah, have like view, view only roles, have admin roles, have developer roles. Uh, but I suppose the, co the cool part about, I suppose, using a platform um, like Tynes is that you can, you know, build a workflow or build a process and you can share it with other people as well. So you can develop something and it automates a process. But if you take the you know the correct approach, you're kind of building modules, mm -hmm. and you can build something and share it with somebody else. So they don't have to build it. So you might have a process to analyze an IP address in like five or six different security tools, or maybe you have a process to uh, look up a the asset owner and you know get their location, get their details, etc. And you're probably checking three or four different mm -hmm. tools to do that. You can now like make that a service for anybody else uh, so that in their times workflows or even outside their times workflows they can call that and uh, and consume it so it's a real yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real power that we're, that we're enabling people with. And it's very much a coding pattern. You know, don't repeat oh, yeah. yourself, right? We've just turned it into no code. A hundred percent, yeah. So yeah. It, is, it, is, it is a coding pattern. Like really, we're, like, it's not that we're, like, we're teaching people to code just in a more effective, yes. uh, more effective way and uh, even a safer way as well. So. Yeah, indeed. And, well, and let's talk a little bit more about that, that value, why, why the SOC analysts were so happy. You, you did a study of this to, to inform this, right? Yeah, we did. So, um, so yeah, we did, we did a, a great study of about 500 security analysts and it's like the voice of the SOC. You can, uh, you can look it up, but it's, um, yeah, we, so, so yeah, I, I worked in the SOC and we, the reason we did it was that we wanted to know like, hey, is the, like, life was really hard when I was working in a SOC. We're like, is it still as hard? And there were some really interesting findings. The thing that I think a lot of people think is like, you know, SOC analysts like, you know, hate their jobs. It's like, it's way too, way too tough. 
And what we found was that actually they felt engaged, they felt oh, uh, like okay. that they were doing a good job, and they felt respected both by their peers and also by uh, by other teams in the in the uh, I suppose in the company. And they knew the work that they were doing was important. And that that was like that's great. Security teams feel respected. But at the same time, it was, uh, yeah, they overwhelmingly felt burnt out. They overwhelmingly yeah. felt yeah. they were doing more alerts. And about 75% said they were completely understaffed. Um, so some of the questions that kind of came out of that was um, that, yeah, the vast majority, well, the vast majority, about two thirds said they planned on leaving their job within the next 12 months. That's not to say that they will leave their job, but that they are burnt. It's that stress. It's that, that just stress. Over yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so like, it was really, it was really interesting for us because obviously, you know, the whole point of the, the reason we started Times, the whole point of the platform, is that we're trying to get rid of those mundane manual tasks. Um, what was funny as well, as well, was when we asked them, "Hey, what are you uh, like? What would you spend your time on?" We thought it would be like, ah, oh, you know, like pen testing or reverse engineering malware okay. or doing some really fun stuff. They were very mature about it. They were like, actually, like updating operational documentation was the, like the number one. Documentation. And we were like, oh. what? Like that's uh, <laughs> that's crazy. But they, yeah, they genuinely wanted to build better processes and you know spend more time actually making the company company safer. Uh, and that was uh, yeah, it wasn't so much. Yeah, it wasn't so much. Hey, we just want to do spend more time on fun stuff. It was actually yeah, we just want to make we want to make the company safer. Um, but yeah, it was a really it was a really interesting study. And they yeah. The other part about it, obviously, was that they, um, yeah, we asked about automation. Um, and I think, yeah, there, there was a little bit of hesitation from the SOC. They felt a little bit threatened by okay. the idea that, like, hey, automation will take away their, uh, will take away some of their jobs. Um, but, yeah, the whole, I suppose, the whole reason that we were, we were asking was, like, actually, there's, you know, there's very few organizations that if you start, if you start automating processes, they're going to be like, okay, we don't need that high count. It's like, actually, we can now, like, people are, crying out for security analysts, people are crying out for good security teams to, to, uh, to be able to do better work. So it's like, yeah, these people are going to be able to, going to, be able to spend more time on, on better, better efforts for their company. Yes, and, like, and nobody wants to spend the time on the boring, mundane, repetitive parts of that process. Let's give that to the computers and let them deal with it. Exactly, that's exactly it. Yeah. So and it's wonderful that you clearly are bringing experience from the SOC into this yep. and actually going out and getting feedback from, from users. Are there particular features that uh, surprised you? Or are there particular features that you didn't anticipate that would like be so useful to, to them? Yeah, completely. So um, like one of the things that we've, uh, we've done, we've gathered, like we've built our own library of workflows, right? So we've got, you know, we built a couple of hundred that, uh, that our customers were, uh, that our, like our customers were using that we saw were mm -hmm. kind of coming up time and time again, um, but then our customers started sharing their own workflows. So they said like, "Hey, I, actually, I've built this one. Can I can I share this with with other people?" And seeing what they've uh, what they've built with those, uh, like they've built with the platform, and they want to share. It's like that's really inspiring. And um, but the sort of stuff that we've seen them start sharing are like, yeah, a little bit more cutting edge, uh, cutting edge processes, oh, cool. and kind of like the, the ones that they're a little bit geeking out about. So there have been some around like, you know, ChatGPT, which is, okay. uh, uh, which, is uh, which is exciting. But there's also like kind of really interesting ones where they're like, we think people should be, you know, moving into the IT automation space. So like, I've actually built this workflow to, you know, all four users and a bunch of different tools really easily. And I want to share it with people because I think that that's where, you know, that's where it's going. And then we're like, oh, this is interesting. We should maybe start talking to some IT teams. And that's been very effective. And um, so, yeah, some of the so some of the workflows that they're building have surprised us, but it's kind of excited us as well. It shows you know the the power of power of times and the power of where we uh, of yeah no code automation where where it can go that it can make the lives of security teams, but also yeah IT teams, DevOps teams, engineering teams uh, easier as well. So no, indeed, yeah, delivering value across those. As you look on, if you're going to look towards the you know doing the study next year, is there certain things that you would hope to see improve or hope to feel that uh, you know SOC analysts are are enjoying better? Yeah, so one of the things that we uh, one of the things that uh, we didn't really do a uh, like test uh, last year was whether or not like it was different in like really large organizations and really small organizations, or whether or not like uh, cert teams or like you know uh, I suppose yeah the, I suppose the the different types of organizations whether it was uh, whether it was different definitely want to uh, definitely want to like engage in that. I think the other thing is like looking at uh, I suppose looking at the maturity of a lot of tools out there, they are trying to get a little bit better at like that noise. I think a lot oh, of companies okay. have tried to, and there's some great companies here, that a lot of companies have tried to tune that. So I'm really hoping that there is a, and not the best, you know, not the best benefit for us, but like I'm really hoping that they, that automation will have helped, but also that a lot of security companies will have, 
I've done a little bit of a better job of getting rid of the, trying to get rid of the pain that the security analysts are feeling. It's, yeah, it's still, uh, it's still hard, but I'm hoping that they'll have done a better job at that. Indeed. Well, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you next year and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. I really <laughs> hope so. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Thomas. This was very much a, it's not so much no code, but no stress yeah, type no of stress. delivery. Exactly, yeah, I, that's yeah. a wonderful message to said. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure, too. If you'd like to learn more about Tynes, visit securityweekly.com slash Tynes RSAC. Thank you, and stick around for more of the live stream. we got a couple more for today.